I am Thor, son of Odin. As long as there is life in my breast, I am running out of things to say. Great, another broken white boy for us to fix. That's my secret, Cat. I'm always angry. You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. With great power comes great responsibility. I can do this all day. Well, good night, Moana! And what's up, everyone, and welcome back. And as always, we are bringing you that fire because tonight we have the one and only Kate Heron on the spaceship tonight, the director, writer, and producer. They hail from Southeast London. You may know her from her work on Sex Education for Netflix or a series of short films with Idris Elba for the Five on Five series. They're also a certified geek and gamer and a true member of the fan fam. But you know why? We have you here tonight in the spaceship. It's because you're currently doing the Lord's work as the director of Marvel's Loki series on Disney Plus. Let's all welcome Kate to Views from the 616. Hi, hello, hello. (laughs) (laughs) So happy to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. And I know the fan fam has really excited to speak to you. We've been teasing them for a while, particularly the views from the 616 folks. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting. And Kate, while we have you, got, I mean, Ben, I mean, mentioned you're, you are a true fan fam already. You already support us. Thank you very much. So we got to ask, can you like share with us, what's some of your earliest memories of being a geek? Oh, okay. I think, honestly, I remember going to watch... Actually, no, I have an earlier one. I was going to say Two Towers, but probably the earliest one is I used to watch the X-Men cartoon yes. and I remember trying to like turn my Barbie into Storm and I like <laughs> melted her hair off because I was trying to like bleach it and make it white. I don't know how I got access to bleach though. This is more a question I should have with my mom. But, okay. like, <laughs> but I remember being like, I'm going to make her Storm and it, yeah, it went very badly wrong. So that's probably like the earliest nerd memory, but also just, yeah, like, I remember seeing Two Towers at the cinema with my friends, like, I think every week that it was out, weirdly. Like, I'd seen Fellowship, Mm. but I remember Two Towers, like, blew my mind. Like, I hadn't seen a battle like that ever in the Mm. cinema. And it was just so, yeah, I loved it. So they're probably my my two earliest memories. (laughs) That's awesome. And you mentioned Storm, so is that your favorite X-Men? Oh, I don't know. Definitely (laughs) one of them. Like, I remember just, I really loved all the female characters in the cartoon. I think because I loved that they were, like, all different but their differences are like what made them stronger i like rogue as well um yes yeah i did like wolverine though but i mean everyone loves wolverine <laughs> but like <laughs> but i am um, but i just remember yeah i just really enjoyed it um because i mm. think they used to play the cartoon in england on like saturday mornings so yeah so i'd kind of just watch it as a kid and be like oh this is- yeah yeah I mean, that's that's that is pretty amazing that you mentioned that because because X-Men anime series was our also my first foray into kind of the world of Marvel and those characters. Like I didn't read any comics or do any other stuff like that was my first entry. And it's interesting, even in England, that was your first entry point. And particularly for for millennials, I'm also a millennial and Fox Kids was it for us. So like you were right on the same wavelength. And you know, growing up with that, like, how do you feel seeing all this being translated little by little into live action and seeing these stories come to life? I just think it's so exciting, right? And like, and also just, I suppose as like effects have changed and like, you know, as all that has like transformed, I think it's just been really exciting, like seeing all these like amazing fantasy worlds kind of come to life and, you know, mm-hmm. different actors. I mean, Hugh Jackman, <laughs> like he played Wolverine for a very long time, but like, it was really cool. And I, I think the thing I loved about the movies is also like the different kind of tones and takes on it, you know, like Logan, like that, that's so unique and so different, yes. but I really enjoyed that. And yeah, I think for me, that's always excited me is like one seeing, you know, just cool characters come to life, but also like, okay, so the, but the filmmakers take on it would be like this, and this is going to be the tone of the story. I suppose it's like different comic book runs, right. With different characters. Exactly. But, yeah. So no, I've just honestly just enjoyed it. It's been fun seeing people's interpretations of, I suppose, diff- yeah, speaking very broadly, like all these different comic book characters, but yeah. Of course, of course. And then obviously we have your interpretation of, you know, an iconic character, now very iconic character, especially with what Tom Hilton has done with Loki for the last decade. Um, I can't believe, even believe it's been that long. And like, we have a, a rich history with the MCU right now. So when we talk about, I'm glad you mentioned that, about how the director's takes and how they develop stories, you know, 
when you started writing these stories, I know you started doing like some fanfics actually. Um, it, you know, you were just doing it to make your friends laugh at the time. So would you say that like, like comedy is really kind of your conduit into storytelling? Definitely. Like, yeah, I remember like writing Lord of the Rings stories because I think we were watching like all those films when I was growing up. And, yeah, but I remember the thing that was I wrote a story where they went to like New York and it was honestly just like Enchanted and I remember Enchanted came out and I was like oh this is a oh, film yeah. that got made <laughs> and I was like yeah. this is some of my fan fiction story I was like maybe I could earn some money doing this and like but yeah but I think it was always fun right because I was also just trying to work out how to tell a story and I suppose comedy is always like a, a fun way to do that right because it's, mm-hmm. the stakes are high obviously because you hope people are going to laugh because it's terrible if they read it and they're just like not laughing and then it's like oh no what did I write but yeah but I think definitely for me it was just a chance to kind of work out what kind of stories I wanted to tell and like and it took away the pressure of me having to think of an idea because I was like oh well there's already these characters here and I can kind of just use that as like you know my sandbox to play in so yeah so I definitely yeah was writing quite a lot of stuff <laughs> nice okay now speaking quite about writing quite a lot of stuff the word on the street is that you wrote a 60 page pitch <laughs> for loki so now you've also said that uh, like maybe 80 to 90 percent of this pitch went into what we've seen on the screen the finished product so how did this process work when you have this vision you know set yeah. like already but then you also have a writer's room and this collaborative process with Marvel and Kevin and all the other producers down the line. So how, you know, how did you make this all come together like that? So basically when I pitched on the show, I had the the first and the second episode already, the scripts were done. Mm. Um, so I, I had, I read those as like, I mean, they obviously evolved and changed a bit, like once I joined, but but they were kind of there. And then I had like a rough arc for the rest of the show. Mm. And so I was kind of using that as my jumping off point. And like, for example, like I knew the show was going to set up the TVA. So I was looking at the script and I was like, okay, well, this stuff I think is really cool. And these are, you know, architecture ideas for the TVA. And these are color palette and lighting ideas for the TVA. Um, So that was kind of, it was kind of, I guess, like a 60 kind of page PowerPoint presentation. Mm-hmm. And, and then I kind of had a printout of paper that went with it. And then I had, because the slides honestly just helped me remember what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> and then and then I had like something to talk about with each slide. But I would say that generally, like, so the writer's room, like the rough kind of shape of the story, like the beginning and end was carved out but how we get from A to B changed quite a bit. Cause sometimes that changes because of, you know, production or, mm-hmm. you know, I'm trying to think even now. Okay. So for example, like Wumi's character that was originally written as like a male soldier and it was like super different. And when I was oh. pitching on it, I was like, you know, I think it'd be really cool. If this was a female character and they were like, Oh yeah, we really like that idea. So I was like, when we, you know, do casting for it, can we just have it open? And, you know, and people read for it and then Wumi read for it and we were like, she's amazing. So like, and then we like rebuilt that character basically around her and her arc across the show because of what she was bringing, that changed quite a bit just because she's an amazing actor and, you know, like her read on it was so cool. So that definitely, you know, affected her character across the show. Whereas like, I'd say like the bigger overarching story in just in terms of what the show was going to do, like that was Mm -hmm. kind of in place. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd say really the the fun thing with working with Marvel is they didn't run these in like, so usually in TV, obviously you have like a showrunner system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in these, I mean, Kevin Feige basically is like the showrunner of Marvel, right? So it's really more that they wanted to run it like one of their movies. So it was running like a film. But I think the, the key thing with Marvel is they're just a very collaborative studio. So they tend to want to work with people that are going to be very collaborative and it's always like best idea wins. So it wasn't a case of kind of, me getting handed scripts that were finished they had amazing ideas and story in but like the story was always evolving and always changing because we just wanted to kind of tell the best story we could and particularly during you know when we were shut down during covid like me and eric martin who was one of our writers on the show and also like marvel and also tom for example you know tom hiddleston (laughs) yeah we were always interrogating the scripts and being like okay is this the best way to tell this emotional beat or this part of the story because we just wanted to tell you know the story in the best way yeah 
Yeah, that's so interesting because we've talked to a lot of different people and we've, you know, had experience pitching and producing and mm -hmm. writing and everything. And to hear that different approach to it is it's really refreshing. And also, Super refreshing. I think <laughs> it, it, you know, it comes off in the end product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun, I think. It was just, I mean, it was just such a unique situation because I wasn't sure when I was pitching on it. I was like, how are you guys going to run this? Like, yeah, is it going to be like this? And then... Kevin Feige was like, no, Louis, like, you know, we make movies, so we're going to run this like a six hour version of one of our films. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Which obviously presents its own challenges in a way, but it definitely was a very yeah. unique and very collaborative way, I think, to make a TV show. So, yes, yeah, so I really enjoyed myself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it definitely shows in the final product, as Ben said. I mean, e even that, that, that film approach, because I, I've noticed with a lot of these Disney Plus shows, even if they may start kind of um, episodic, they get into the cinematic realm towards the end. And, you know, Loki is feeling this way as well. So it's feeling pretty on a grand scale as if it was a film. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, one thing that I really connected with on this show is that the idea of determinism versus free will. Yes. Because, like, as a child, this is something that just occupied my mind. Like, I've spoken about it reviewing the show. I had this whole theory in my head about choices and how it would determine your life and all this. You know, I was I was that type of kid. So it's like, you know, seeing this on screen, it's just been fantastic for me. But my question is, what's your personal stance on it? Or do you feel that we're the dealer of the cards or are we just playing the hand that we're dealt? Oh, it's so funny, right? Because I definitely lean more on the side of maker of our own destiny. And yeah, you have to like, I think probably because of like, even just with my career, right? Like I've been like, okay, well, because I, I, I remember I found it quite hard to get my first directing job. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to go out there. And I think I read Robert Rodriguez's like Rebel Without a Crew. And he mm -hmm. was like, print a card and say you're a filmmaker. And now you're a filmmaker. And I kind of always had that attitude. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm just gonna tell people I'm a filmmaker. And I will magic it into reality. But at the same time, obviously, like, there's weird coinc uh, sorry, coincidences that happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm like, oh, like, I don't know, is it? Is it all decided? Or is it? Yeah, I don't know. I read a lot about um, simulation theory. I find mm -hmm. that really Ooh, interesting. Yes. Yeah, because I, I love games, right? Like both of you. And I am like, no, maybe <laughs> I'll be in a game. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, so no, so definitely I sometimes, I, I like to think that we have a certain amount of control over our own destiny mm -hmm. and that yeah. we can make change and grow. But at the same time, yeah, there is like sometimes just weird coincidental stuff that happens where I'm like, you know, it gives me pause. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you would not be a good employee for the TVA then because you question too much. You 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 have your own frame of like reference and, and and understanding in mind, and and I think like they need people who are just very like by the book, like whatever you say goes. So, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One other thing about the show that we love to see is the fact that it was, I mean, it was kind of already canon, but canon for the cinematic universe anyway. That the Loki's or the Loki's we know, Sylvie and. Loki Larson, um, their bisexuality, the fact that they are gender fluid, and the fact that we see this just not placed in a kind of checkbox kind of way, like let's make sure we're getting all the diversity checks. It's like, this is just part of their character. This is part of who they are. It makes sense. And, you know, because of that, you know, we would love to see more of that in the future in MCU stories. And also we got to say, because of that point, we were worried about the relationship between Sylvia and Loki. Like, we were scared that's going to fall into those traditional heteronormative roles. So is that something you considered as you were writing this? Or are you kind of a Loki Sylvie shipper or nah? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I would say like the one thing I would say is I didn't write it, um, but it was definitely something important to like me and the writers. Like mm -hmm. I think because, you know, the whole show, like it's called Loki. It's about Loki's identity and a core question for us at the center was, I mean, we say it in episode three, but like what makes a Loki a Loki? Yes. And I think that for me was really important to answer. And, you know, he is gender fluid and he is bi in the comics. He's also been written as Pan. And I think it's important to just acknowledge that aspect of his personality or well, their personality just because it's who they are. So I think that was really key because it would, it just, for me, you know, like I'm bi and I felt like you know, if we're really digging into someone's identity and what makes up their soul, like it feels, it just, yeah, I was like, why would we not talk about that? And, and also just in the sense of it's canon in the comics. So let's make it canon in the MCU. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So are you a fan of Loki and Sylvie <laughs> being, you know? We call, we call them Soki. <laughs> Soki. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't use shipping. that. Ugh. We don't want them to be shipped. But that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's been so interesting seeing the divide of like some people are like really into it and some people are like, no. But I think that's kind of the fun thing with it, right? Is that, you know, you see Mobius kind of say to him, like, you fell for yourself. Are you like, <laughs> seriously? But at the same time, I think, you know, there's something beautiful in the sense that he's been, he's a character of a lot of pain. He has, you know, he's been through so much. And I think it's such growth for his character to see him have space to, you know, have feelings like that for someone. Cause you know, it wasn't so long ago we saw him in New York <laughs> and like, so I think for us, that was a big part and like self-love is a big message across the show as well. So yeah. So I, I would always say like, I think that's the fun thing about it. And it wasn't meant to be a definitive, like for the audience, like you should feel this way or this way, because I think that's kind of the cool thing, right. About people yeah. watching it, is that it's meant to create debate and it's meant to create discussion. Likewise, we have a completely different topic, but like the TVA, are they good? Are they bad? Yes. And I yes. think that was something we were always wanting to do was that we weren't going to give necessarily uh, a clear, not necessarily an answer. Cause I think we have answers, but more just in the sense of this isn't so, you know, leaving it up to people's own free will, I guess, how they can feel about the stuff we're talking about <laughs> rather than, you know, making it such an obvious choice, I guess. <laughs> now, um, you brought up somebody right there uh, that I got to ask about. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, from episode one, I was like, okay, the TVA are wrong, you know, out of control, you know, just whatever their plan is, is not right. I was that yeah. person. Day one. <laughs> Didn't but... Talk you also, you know, and I saw that you wanted Goo Goo cast in this. So you cast, you know, one of my favorite actresses in this as Ravona. So, you know, I'm like, why does Ravona have to keep breaking my heart? Because I was straight up and down Team Renslayer. You know, I didn't care that the TVA was wrong. It was like, you know, whatever this woman wants, let's go for it. Up until episode five. She famously and yells, prune me, Ravona, on the show. Prune so. me, you know. Like, but when her privilege, her pretty privilege just ran out on me in episode five, I was just like, okay, yeah. I can't take it no more. I don't, you know, your plan. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you're up to, but it, it's, I'm done with you. So is there any hope for the Renites or the Slayers or, you know, <laughs> however you want to call them? <laughs> I think the amazing thing with Goo Goo, right, is that she's so different in everything she does. And that's why I was excited for her to play the character because you know, it is meant to feel conflicted. Like, you know, you see yeah. her make these decisions, like when she prunes Mobius, for example, but then we have that moment with her afterwards and it's not like she's just being villainous or anything about it. She looks, it's her friend. And I, I think Gugu finds that fine line really well. And I think that for me kind of does fall into the TVA of like, sometimes they have to make these awful decisions, but it doesn't necessarily, she doesn't feel good about it. Cause I think you see that, you know, when Mobius gets pruned that she's like taking a minute. And I think for me, that was really important. And also like in the courtroom with Sylvie, it's so interesting, right? Like when they're both talking to each other and you feel like she is on board, but then Sylvie threatens her life. So what mm -hmm. is she going to do? She's not just going to want to die. So I think that for me was really key. And I mean, yeah, I'm a massive fan of Gugu. And I think that's something we both spoke yeah. about a lot was always, you know, some of her actions obviously are seen as villainous, but at the same time, it's like, well, why is she making these decisions? And that echoes across all our characters in the show. You know, like, like I said, with Loki, yeah. we kind of dissect that in a lot of detail in episode one. <laughs> like, why did he make those decisions? And I think that was really key for me. It's like, not necessarily, we don't have to agree with some of the decisions she's made, but we have to understand them. So, yeah, so that's been important across it. See, I didn't agree with the TV at all. You know, but it was like whatever Ravona's drawn for, I'm down with it. You know, I, that, that, you know. But, it, but but I was trying to explain, like Kate, Kate, the level of orchestrated lying just across the board is just massive, and I'm just like trying to get him to see that and understand. And he's like, "Oh, she's so pretty." But the show is about the god of lies. I, I'm supposed to be mad at her for lying, like. Well, but speaking of the pretty privilege, uh, you know that that's when we understand, like. These characters can do heinous things, and, and we see that in, in, in TV movie across the board. But because they, they're good looking or traditionally beautiful, they get away with it. So, you know, when we speak about that, how do you feel about Loki and his redemption arc when we, when we put him in that kind of frame? 
Because me personally, I've always loved Loki. He's my Disney prince. He can do no wrong, even when he's doing wrong. So, you know, what is your thought on that? I think that's the amazing thing, though, right, with Tom's performance as that character, because he brings such empathy to Loki. You know, in Thor, when you see him find out that he's adopted and then also just like his actions, I'm like, don't do that. But you still feel empathy for him because you can see why he's making these decisions. And I think, and he's very funny and very witty. And it's not just that it's not so clean cut and that he's just like, you know, like a ha 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 bad guy. I think that's what I like about it. And I think for Loki in particular, that's why I think the show so much was about good versus bad because it's so much, he's so much like a mixture of both those things often at the same time. (laughs) So I think that was always the fun of it, definitely. But yeah, but it's so weird. I was thinking this the other day that, yeah, like there might, yeah, he he is like technically now like a Disney prince because Disney and Marvel obviously are working together, which is quite funny. So Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, I I mean, this is the same Loki that was just going nuts in New York, uh, you know, like a a few days ago, technically. And then, but thanks to the really phenomenal writing direction, like we all have felt even missful, especially like during those Loki and Sylvie scenes. So and at this point, like, you can't even, I personally feel like you can't call Loki a villain either. Um, and, and I think you've even said so yourself that you love the villains, particularly the ones that aren't so cut and dry. So, you know, do we see like these, this heroic arc in Marvel is, is characters do the wrong things first and then they redeem themselves? Yeah, I think that's the amazing thing, though, right, is like with the redemptive art, because I think that was kind of the weight on our shoulders for like where Loki had been before, right? Because he did go from like villain to antihero, and we all got to experience that over 10 years. (laughs) So, you know, it felt earned because it was like a slow burn. It wasn't just suddenly in one movie, he flipped, you know, we kind of saw these little actions or little moments of hope. And I think that was really key. But then I think for us with the show, we were thinking, okay, well, I mean, Tom always talks about Loki, like keys on a piano, right? And he was like, we've seen certain keys on the piano across the movies, but let's show some new keys. So I think that was key for us as well as like, this isn't the same Loki, you know? And, 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 And I think there's something interesting in that because it's like nature versus nurture, right? Like, cause obviously his journey now is so different. So he's not gonna necessarily go on exactly the same arc and like you said, he was in New York not that long ago. I mean, he took someone's eyeball out. Yes. <laughs> and like, and Sylvie as well, you know. Sylvie we saw attacking TVA agents in the opening of episode two and like really took them out. And I, I think that's the real fun thing in it is that, you know, on some level everyone's like, oh, the TVA, like, you know, Ren, say, for example, like, oh, she's she's evil. But it's also like, but also look at the characters that we've put at the centre of this. Like, no one in this show is completely redeemable. But hopefully there is room for growth and change. And I think that was always the fun thing for me is the gray area. Like all our characters kind of play in that. So, yeah. And for me, that just makes good characters. (laughs) So you don't necessarily always know which way they're going to go. So which feels appropriate for a show that Loki is leading and, you know, a story that he's operating within. So Indeed. That's really (laughs) interesting that you said that, because I think that really works in the favor of this show is that, both the TVA and Loki are questionable because in Mm -hmm. some cases, especially I've been pointing this out a lot throughout our shows is the Marvel characters are sometimes the heroes are a lot more villainous than even the villains for the most part Mm -hmm. until Mm -hmm. they just flip a script at one point and they're like, Oh, I'm tired of that. But they're not always addressed or all their sins are never, you know, brought to bear for a lot of them. But I feel like Loki has through how he got to see what's going on. And then also, I know that whenever he, if he does return to the rest of the main Marvel universe, there'll still be some questions that need to be answered by, you know, other characters. So many questions, man. Um, and so we, we're, we're almost at the end of Loki series right now. We're one through episodes one through five. And what I've learned is you were heavily involved in the approval of like damn near every detail in the items, design of the show. Are there, are there any, is there one or more things you're particularly proud of that made it into the show? Oh, do you know what? I um, I was so pleased with just all the fun Easter eggs we managed to get into episode five. I can't take credit oh for all of them because it was definitely a collaborative team effort because yeah. like, for example, the Thanos copter, Kevin yeah. Wright, my executive producer, that was his, that was him. 
And I just, because I didn't know about that. And I remember he told me about it and I was like, that's so funny. I was like, we have to, can we put it in there? And they were like, yeah, we totally can. So I think that was really fun. And Throg, obviously, getting him yes. in. Um, and we recorded Chris Hemsworth for that, by the way. Wow. On that yet, but we recorded him for that. So that's new recording. <laughs> Wait, recorded, recorded him vis- uh, audio? Making audio? the noise. He, his, his he voice, the audio. Yeah, he's yeah. screaming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like a whole new recording, not recycled. Like, that's, he recorded that. <laughs> like, wow. So, but yeah, but that was so fun to get in there, I think. And. Yeah, I'm, and, and I just, I really enjoyed, because I had this one thing at the beginning, I was like, oh, maybe I'll tweet, like, you know, some of the fun comic book references we did. But I've kind of decided, oh, I don't want to actually, because I don't know, like, you know, it's just been fun, because I watched some of the YouTube videos, and mm. I always, you know, as a fan of stuff, it's like a treasure hunt, right? And it's fun yes. to kind of dig those up. So mm. I think something, I, I still need to do it, but I've been thinking of stuff I could tell people that's more like, I suppose, like a director's commentary or trivia, but... I have been like so not unsurprised because the fans are so smart, but just it's been really cool like watching people like dig up some of the Easter eggs and be like, oh, it's referencing this comic or it's doing this. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's been really fun with the detail. And yeah, and just me and the whole team, like we had so much fun because five was, you know, just a really fun place to do that. Oh, and something I could tell you. Yes. Um, I haven't spoken about this yet either. So, because the Teletubbies referenced, yeah, it was, it was episode five. So it was just basically. So I wanted the void to feel like kind of like an overgrown garden because it's like this forgotten place. And mm. essentially, I realized I had bridge. Uh, sorry, pitched the British countryside. <laughs> yeah, it looks a lot like that. Mm. But I remember talking to ILM, who we were making the effects with, and they were like, "Okay, well, what are you thinking?" And I just, I couldn't think. I, and I just was like, "Oh my god, you know what it is?" I was like, "It's like the Teletubbies. It's <laughs> like rolling hills of dystopia, <laughs> and that's what we're going for. But it's not sunny. It's like you know, got this kind of like mist, and it's yeah. yeah. And that's how the Teletubbies got into the show. And instead of a beautiful infant for the sun, you have you know a life like. <laughs> ridiculous and I, like, luckily when I, they went with it i think they were like who is this director <laughs> i was oh, like you know like, the tummy tummy that guys. is so awesome to hear yeah and it's <laughs> such a perfect you know representation of those rolling hills but yeah. thank you for that because like i mean i love all this stuff because i'm the <laughs> kid who was you know comments from day one and so even when i was in the theater and they were like you know and thanos turns around and i'm like oh my god you know so to see like the uh, living tribunal's head sitting there. I'm like, whoa! And then the Thanos chapter. I was tweeting about that last year, and I was making a joke for all the like hardcore people who are like, oh, the MCU needs to be more like the comics. And I'm like, if the you know MCU was more like the comics, you'd have this. And you know, it showed up. And it showed up. <laughs> yeah. So. I think it was just fun because we were like, because the whole idea is right. The void is where things were sent to be deleted because they mm-hmm. shouldn't be. Yeah. And I was, it was just too funny not to put it in there. Cause, and I love that he has his name on the side. It might yes. be like at school when you'd have like your name on your pencil case or something. And I was like, why did you yeah. paint his name on the side? But, and that's why, oh, also on the comics, I would say that's why it was so important with Richard with classic, cause he's classic, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. the MCU, obviously, they built a very established look for their costumes, which is really cool. But I was like, well, again, he's like the original Loki. He should look like, you know, one, like the original Loki. And, Bless Richard. I remember he was very into it. And yeah, it was just so much fun to see him bring that character to life, you know? I mean, really smart, really smart acting and writing there. Episode five was absolutely my favorite thus far. When he sat down and threw his tape up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I wonder like how hard of a time do you have like when you say you watch these YouTube videos and there's got to be some some takes that are just full blown reaches and you're like, bro, that's not what we said at all. Like, or that's not what the, that's not what we meant at all. But like, like, what do you think about that when you see that stuff? Like, there's got to be a lot of them. I know even we may have done it at, at least once. I think it's kind of fun, right? That's the fun of it. Because like, you know, like I like watching Marvel films and I, I kind of, I'm usually part of that debate, <laughs> like when stuff's coming out and I'm like, what does it mean? Is it this character or is it going to, is this going to happen? And yeah. no, I think it's kind of the fun of it. And yeah, seeing what connects with people, what doesn't connect with people. 
Um, and like you were talking about, like Sylvie and Loki, like are people on board with that? Are people not? And I think that's always interesting, that kind of debate and then the discussions within the TVA. And no, I just really enjoy it, to be honest. I never comment. I just watch stuff. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I just think it's kind of fun just to see what people are thinking and yeah, what's connecting with them and yeah, maybe what's not connecting. So yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, go ahead, Ben. Sorry. Oh, yeah. And speaking on that, like you said that, you know, you pay attention to every little detail. There are so many details in the backgrounds and the foregrounds of every shot. And, you know, of course, you know, everyone, <laughs> us included, from pretty much episode one, as soon as Ravona shows up, as soon as the TVA yeah. shows up, as soon as, and then it just, I mean, you're, you're laying it on thick, to say the least. Right. Like we, <laughs> we have a lion. <laughs> You know, we have a center of this face, this face, this face. And so everyone's screaming Kang, and we know Jonathan Major. So you had to know this was coming, right? Or are you just, is it the ultimate, like, haha? Or, right. Like, this is your Mephisto, or like, <laughs> where's everywhere, nowhere? Like, what? what is your game, Kate? <laughs> Stop playing with our emotions. <laughs> I think that's what. I think we all will, you know, because no one at the moment, right, knows who's behind the TVA. So I think we're always predicting. And it's been interesting seeing, I've seen like multiple lists and like, yeah, I think that's sort of part of the fun of it though, right? Like discussions, yeah. there are so many different characters and yeah. And like you said, with WandaVision, you know, what happened there? And yeah, so I think it's definitely interesting to see what people are discussing and yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you were like no look at this look at this <laughs> yeah i mean i i can't lie i stood up and screamed at the end of episode five because i was like oh you like <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely and you know as we as we wind down i i want to just ask you from a personal perspective like you've you you've hit this a lot of people would say like this is kind of the ultimate uh, one of the ultimate things to do as a director as a writer to be able to work with Marvel and and this be inserted to such a huge pooch piece and and it's interesting because it's like Loki like he's told over and over he's a loser he's meant to be the loser you feel that way like when you try to do creative things like this and you're told no all the time but in reality you're accomplishing a lot and Loki has accomplished a great deal of things and with he does he has you know i mean i mean even personally so like how what does success mean to you in life like how would you determine success or winning do you know what like i think for me like determining success for me is like just getting to do the job i love because like mm -hmm. i i'd always like because it is hard because i think you know, even after I did those shorts with like Idris, like I remember did those and they were with, like BBC yeah. and I was like, oh, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker now and I'm just going to make films. But I was, I, you know, it, I wasn't any less of a filmmaker, but I wasn't earning money through making films. Like I, I went back to temping like pretty much a month later because I still couldn't get my foot in the door with TV work. So I think for me, part of it, I suppose, could be measured in the sense that yeah, I I now, you know, when I got sex education, I was able to just do this job full time. It wasn't something, you know, because I used to get to do it maybe like once a year on a short because I'd spend mm -hmm. all year saving up money and then I'd go make my short. And But I think, honestly, success, oh, it's tricky, isn't it? Um, probably just seeing the stories connect with people because, honestly, I think that for me has always meant the most, whether it was on, like, a short I made with a bunch of comedians I'm friends with and that felt great because you know you pour so much love and energy into something anytime you make it no matter how big it is so I think for me that yeah. was always the end goal was just yeah do the stories connect with people and who are the audience did we find an audience and yeah so I think for me maybe that's the better way to think of success rather than I get to do the job full time <laughs> just in case because you don't know where things are going to go. Right. Or how things could change. So, yeah. And I and I think you're giving a lot of people um, understanding and hope, especially for for people who are creatives who want to enter this space. And it feels like right now your approach is very Yoda like like do or not do. There's you know, there is no try. Just do it. How did, how did you learn your way out of, you know, getting past that hump of things have to be perfect, you know, making excuses? Uh, I think honestly, because. I used to, when I first started making shorts, cause like, it's really weird. Cause I'm generally like quite an introvert and I'm quite shy, but like in doing, obviously being a director, you have to like talk to a lot of people. And so my personality was almost at war with my dreams. <laughs> so I was yes. like, what am I, why am I doing this job? But I love it and I really enjoy it. And I think that was key for me working out. Okay. I don't have to be the 
loudest voice on set. I just like on Loki, for example, I had an amazing, an amazing first AD called Richard. And I said to him, well, can you just say action for me? Because I don't want to like yell it every time. And you know what I mean? Stuff like that, kind of finding my way. But I would generally say it's just going out there and doing something. So I think there's always that voice in the back of my head when I first start making shorts where I'd be like, oh, I don't have enough money or, you know, like I couldn't afford like the most expensive camera equipment Um, Mm -hmm. or like, oh, what if my idea sucks or what if, you know, it's a comedy and people watch it and they don't laugh, which did happen. Some of my shorts, like we played them at festivals and like me and my team would be like, oh no, (laughs) it was like really, but I think the thing I found from every short was like, well, I just always felt good having gone out there and just done it. And I think it's better to have tried than not done anything. And I think I found that the more I tried and the more I made stuff, like obviously like I started to find like my community of filmmakers and my friends that like I now know who are also directors and making stuff. And I think that voice got smaller and smaller in that sense, you know, like the kind of the bad voice of being like oh you can't do this or and I think that was the other thing as well was like not waiting for stuff to be perfect because it never is perfect like everything I do even on Loki there'd be things where you know we might have had to compromise or change but not in a way that it means we're not happy with the story just you know on a basic level like I don't know like it might have rained one day and me yeah. and Walter might land oh let's shoot it like this but then it rained and we were like oh okay we can't do that so let's cover it like this and so it's not necessarily compromising the creative intent because you still bring what you want to do to it, but it's just sort of approaching it from a different angle. But yeah, but my best advice is just sort of just don't wait for permission, just go do it and to fail and fail again. Cause I did so many times and just, yeah. And just to keep making stuff, honestly, cause I think that kind of always kept me going. I always thought, okay, well, if I can only afford to make one short a year, I'll just do that then. And I'll just keep, making stuff until yeah. someone gives me a job you know keep going right exactly exactly because I, I always think there's that you know there was points where I was like okay well so many people would have given up by now and it was funny because I go to events and I remember people be like oh you're still doing this <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like yeah I am like I remember even when I was a waitress like I worked in like an Italian restaurant here and I remember that we had these napkins that had like inspirational quotes on And I remember there was a director who I'm very good friends with, but he was doing very well. And I remember that he posted a picture. It must have been on Facebook at the time. Think about what year it was. But I remember that he posted a picture of the napkin and he was at like dinner with like all these like TV executives. And I remember being like, I folded like 200 of those napkins (laughs) today because it was like a big chain restaurant. And I felt like his life and my life were in such different places. Mm. But I think that was the really key thing as well was like, not comparing myself to other people's journeys because you know we all kind of I guess it's just different for everyone right and we all have our own story so I think that was really key for me as well was like shutting that out and not googling I don't know how old was Steven Spielberg when he made Jaws and Mm. stuff like that Mm. and just being like I'm just going to focus on me and try and tell stories that I care about and hopefully I'll find people that like them as well so yeah yeah, there's a lot of rambling but I hope that's helpful no it's exceptionally helpful and and exceptionally helpful in true Loki fashion Uh, everyone understanding you have your own timeline so it's on you and also I just love that because it's something that you were talking about earlier and what we've been talking about is determinism and fate and like you said Mm -hmm. that you believe you know you you create your destiny but I also believe it's like when you choose a path and you stay on it the universe is going to conspire with you to create that path Mm. that you want, but you have to, you know, stay on it. So. Yeah, for sure. So Kate, we have to make sure you get through this rap segment. That's our quick rapid fire, somewhat rapid fire question and answer segment. We're going to give you some choices and you just have to pick between them. Okay. You ready? Okay. All right. The first Magneto or professor X. (laughs) Professor X. So I was like, really? Like, oh, oh, God. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Loki or Sylvie? Loki. Ooh. You said you love so villains. It's, it's going to be like, oh! <laughs> like, but no, because he's like, you know, what led me to the job. And yeah, but I do I do love them both, though. I love them both. It's like choosing a favorite child. It's hard. I understand. Uh, who's your favorite villain in any story or medium? Oh. Do you know what? I've always liked Scar in The Lion King. Mm. I just found him, he's just really funny. And I, I always felt kind of bad for him. And 
Yeah, I always like the Disney villains. I like Ursula as well. I understand the motives. It's, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just like villains, I think. They always tend to be quite funny, right? <laughs> so I'm always kind of drawn to the villain and then they get punished and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> like, why are they punishing the funny one? But anyway, but no, probably I'll say Scar. I'll say Scar. Yeah. Excellent. Really okay. Lex Luthor <laughs> or Dr. Doom then? So who did you say? Lex Luthor or Dr. Doom? Hmm. Lex Luthor. He's my favorite too. Um, we know you're a good Battlestar Galactica fan. Uh, who's your favorite character from the 2000 show? Cara Thrace. Ooh, very good. I just love. I just love her. Yeah, I just think she's so cool. But yeah, I didn't even think that hard about that one. I was just like, <laughs> it was like, oh, right, no. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> like... How it goes? Uh, <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek? Okay, so I. I would say Star Wars, but I've only just started watching Star Trek. Okay. So it's hard for me to, because I'm really enjoying it, but I'm mm -hmm. like so early days on it. So yeah, I would say Star Wars. Okay, that's fine. Do yourself a favor and watch Star Trek Discovery. That is top three Star Trek series. Okay, watch that. Definitely is. Okay, okay, great. Yes, yes. the first season is like, I, I watched, I'm honestly only a few episodes into the very, very beginning. And there's a song oh. about the ship in the first episode, I think. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they're in like the cafeteria and they're like, on the starship. <laughs> I was just like, I was like, what is this show? This is kind of crazy. Then. It's, it's so hokey. Like, it was, it's okay. <laughs> it's wow. so hokey now. Um, yeah. let's, uh, go ahead, Ben. Um, what character's death in any medium hurts you the most? Okay, so it's a slightly cheat question because he does come back in a sense, but Gandalf, I just was destroyed. Oof. I, yeah, I, I just didn't like. I, I didn't read. I never read the books, so I thought he was done. You know, I thought that was it. <laughs> and so when he showed up in the next one, I was like, oh, you know, it was like the best thing ever for me because I thought he yeah. was done. Yeah. yeah, I wonder. I wonder your pop culture references. Uh, Fresh Prince or Martin? um fresh prince i don't know if i like is there a show called martin <laughs> martin lawrence <laughs> i know you from the uk so that's why i'm like maybe she knows maybe I've she doesn't seen it yeah yeah okay, but... fresh prince used to be on like every single day when i was growing up but i don't know oh. if martin, like um, maybe it was here but I, I never saw it like yeah so fresh prince i wanted to ask just in case so yeah that's amazing <laughs> yeah um, um... <laughs> so british uh, go ahead ben i mean if you could have any one superpower what would it be Oh, I always want to say flying, but I'm scared of heights. So it just feels like a bad idea. Maybe like invisibility. That could be kind of fun, you know, just pop up in places. And yeah, that could be kind of cool. I'll say invisibility. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, you've survived the rap segment and our interview, which means you survived for all nerd shows. Thank you so much, Kate. We appreciate you. We had a blast. I hope you did too as well.